Today's guests are Porter Collins and Harris Kupperman, two investors who over the past few years have navigated the turbulent markets better than anyone I know. We talk about how another surge in energy prices could make it impossible for the Federal Reserve to fight inflation and ultimately might force the Fed to pivot. Can't believe I'm saying it. Before we get into it, Harris Kupperman has a research product, Kedem, Cuppy's event-driven monitor, that tracks event-driven opportunities in the stock market, sometimes referred to as special situations. Forward Guidance is running a special where if you use my link and discount code, you can get $1,000 off to Kedem for an entire year. So if you're a chief investment officer, hedge fund manager, or anyone running a sizable portfolio, stay till the end of this interview where Porter and I talk about how we have benefited from Kedem, as well as for additional details about how you can sign up for a four-week free trial. Now, let's get on to the interview. I am here with Harris Kupperman of Praetorian Capital and uh, Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor and Porter Collins of Seawolf Capital. Guys, great to have you here. Great to be here. You have a lot in common in your views on valuation, uh, on the Federal Reserve, inflation. A lot of your energy is focused, no pun intended, on the energy markets. You were just saying before we started recording that the Federal Reserve kind of thinks it's in control, but maybe it's not. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the Federal Reserve has been chasing inflation basically since they realized there was inflation. And it's kind of funny, really, because, you know, in Q1, they were still printing money with QE. And, you know, I had my mom calling me up and crying about the price of, you know, broccoli and zucchini and stuff. And, like, I, I've never bought broccoli in my life. I, I, I couldn't care less. But, you know, even she knew that there was inflation. And she was telling me, oh, it's 19 cents more this week. And then, you know, it's 20 cents more the next week. And but no one at the Fed ever goes shopping or, you know, uses money. So they just had no idea. The last people to know everything. But then, you know, effectively, a lot of the inflation we're seeing is being caused by energy. Uh, you know, owner's equivalent rent, obviously, is, you know, a big piece of the puzzle, as is uh, wages. But those are kind of like the good inflation, you know. Wages going up helps, you know, the middle class. Everyone likes that. You know, uh, owner's equivalent rent going up means that the middle class is making some money. That's kind of like the give and take. But they hate food and energy. And so, effectively, the Federal Reserve has been chasing energy uh, around on the screen. And, um, you know... I don't think they're going to catch it. Uh, in the end, you know, I think energy is going much higher, and they're not going to ever, ever catch it. And it's kind of like the Fed. They like to pretend that, you know, oh, we're, we're targeting the CPI, and, we, you know, we, we, we turn the knob a little here on uh, QE, QT, or a little here on interest rates. And they forget that when you have a multi-million barrel deficit each day, <laughs> they, 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 can't, it, it, they, they don't control that. They... Um, they like to pretend they do, and maybe they'll crash the global economy and destroy enough uh, demand that eventually the price of energy comes down. But, but outside of that, I mean, energy's the captain now, <laughs> I like to say. Uh, Porter, what do you think? I agree with a lot of those thoughts. I mean, I, I think I would add uh, a couple more on top of that in terms of, um, you know, I think the last time I was on this podcast, I was talking about how, you know, the, the inflation was going to go you know, a lot hotter and a lot higher than people thought, and the market was going to go a lot lower. And, and you know, lucky or good, that, that's happened. And I think a lot of there's some other structural things in there that just won't, I don't think will bring uh, inflation down to where they want, right? First of all, we've had this quickly over, right? So not over, but 90% of everything we, we have in this country is made from China. And that's going one way, right? And so if you, when you, when you, repatriate a lot of these these uh you know manufacturing processes it's a lot more expensive and you need more labor right so then labor stickier for longer right and you have uh you have all these unions where you know they i think it's uh who's that uh amazon and starbucks and then the railways you know they're all pushing for higher higher wages and, and if you look at wages as a percentage of of corporate profits to 70 year low. And I think you're finally, finally you've hit the bottom of that and starting to head back up, right? And then, um, and then just the, the politics of, you know, war is inflationary, right? And, and you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't move stuff the way you did before. And then you just have the, you know, I, I would call the ESG idiots who've killed everything. And, you know, they are the reason, um, you know, that, energy is where it is. And, you know, I'm a big believer in this book called Capital Returns, right? And it's, it's, it's the capital cycle. And if, you know, if you don't invest, um, you know, for a long time, 
you know, you get to a point where you, you, you stop being able to pull stuff out of the ground and then the people who are, who, who are around and can survive, returns go up a lot. And conversely, you know, my, my short book, I'm short a lot of the things where, you know, all this capital plowed into tech and it's shockingly still plowing into tech. If you look at the flows year to date, it's, it's almost entirely uh, large cap tech. And, you know, we don't we didn't need the 45th food delivery service, the 45th, uh, you know, uh, payments on online payment system. Right. It, it went to, went too far. And, you know, a lot of these things are still it's, you know, it's just really stupid, silly value valuations, you know, EV EV car companies, you know, like Lucid and whatever. They, they just twenty five billion dollars. They don't make cars. It's ridiculous. Right. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of those. Uh, inflationary themes, uh, energy, reshoring, geopolitical issues. That's outside of, largely outside of the remit of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has some impact on car market or housing because it's very interest rate sensitive and the Fed does control like short term interest rates. But uh, what do you, what, what do we get when the Federal Reserve has hiked interest rates from zero to 3%, soon to be 4%, maybe 4.5%, maybe higher? And the, the reason that they're doing that is to, crush demand, stop demand in order to reduce inflation. But if that's not the true cause of the inflation, what ends up happening? I think what Porter's saying is right. If globalization was deflationary for 40 years, then putting that all in reverse is inflationary. It's, it's just logical. And the Fed doesn't uh, control trade policy. They don't control energy policy. I mean, they don't control you know, any of these things. Uh, what they're going to do and what they've basically said they're going to do, and, and think of it in terms of energy, okay? So let's say next year we have a 5 million barrel deficit uh, of oil, okay? What they're effectively saying is, America, we're rich, we have money, we can afford energy, we're going to go around the world and play whack-a-mole, and we're going to get rid of 5 million barrels of demand, but you know, we don't want to do it to Americans because you know, they, they vote for us. So we're going to do it, you know, we're going to go to India, you know, we're going to grab a couple hundred thousand barrels there because you know, they're poor and they're having a you know, currency crisis. We're going to go to Pakistan, they're almost bankrupt. Let's just take all their energy demand. You know, let's go to Turkey, you know, they're, they're massive importers. Let's just you know, knock them off the map. You know, that's what they're basically doing as they uh, raise rates. They're knocking everyone off the map. I mean, look at, look at the UK. I mean, they're our you know, best friends, but we already knocked them off the map too. And so that's what we're doing. We're basically trying to reduce demand by 5 million barrels because the Federal Reserve has no capacity to raise uh, the supply side. And I think, um, you know, one, they're, they're basically, you know, crushing demand or trying to, but what's odd is that they've not really succeeded at it. Uh, you know, the other thing they're going to end up doing is bankrupting all the other central banks. And we see all these central banks now, you know, central banking is like other banking. You're uh, allowed to, you don't have to do mark to market. So, I mean, the central banks, they all did a bunch of QE at the top of uh, the interest rates, uh, you know, the bond cycle. So they bought all these bonds that, you know, in Europe, they, you know, they, they got them all at negative yields. And now, you know, when you think of the duration, and a lot of it's long duration because they're doing yield cur curve control, well, their mark to market losses are in the trillions. And so, I mean, look at the Federal Reserve. They have like 50 billion of equity and, you know, 8 trillion of assets. I mean, what do you think the mark to mark is? They, they probably have like a, a trillion of negative equity, which is fine because you, you don't have to uh, recognize that under banking rules. But you do have to recognize the billion or two a day of uh, carry losses. I mean, they're, they're losing a billion or two billion dollars a day right now. Just, and as that, that, that uh, debt rolls, I mean, it's going to get worse. Um, and so, so th th that comes against the balance sheet, which means the Treasury has to put more capital in there to, to buffer it. But if you do QT, then you're actually recognizing the losses. And that's where this gets really tricky because it doesn't take a lot of QT at you know, down 20%, down 30% on your MBS portfolio, where, where suddenly like, you have no equity left at your bank. And you know, I, you know, I, I see the whole central banking system, in, including you know, the insurance companies and you know, everyone else that has this giant mark-to-market loss all having a crisis. And I think that's the crisis that, that's being created here that no one's talking about. You can't just take rates up like this. Totally agree. I mean, you, know, you, you, you combine the two factors of, you know, what drove the world for the past, you know, 10, 20 years was peak, it was cheap energy and cheap rates. And those are gone, right? And, you know, I don't know how you put the genie back in the bottle. And, you know, the, the Japan, Europe, and the U.S. have been running their deficit, running their balance sheet like an emerging market currency, right? Or, or old emerging market currency because the, the new current emerging markets 
actually run their balance sheet prudently because they, they, they haven't been allowed to run it like a bunch of idiots like we have. You know, the, the U.S., uh, the, the uh, government spending is up 20% year over year. We're, we're, we're handed out $400 uh, million or billion dollars for student debt relief, uh, $430 billion for climate change, $1 trillion in infrastructure, Ukrainian relief, right? It, the list goes on. That we're we're digging, you know, when when you when the rule number one when you're a crisis you stop digging, right? We're we're still digging the hole, making it worse, and so, you know, I I just don't know how we get out of this. That's 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 my biggest worry is that you know how, how does the UK get out of the what the, what they're in, and sadly I think the only answer is the U.S. is going to have to reverse course probably fairly soon. I mean. You know, I don't know if that makes me bullish or bearish, but they're going to have to re reverse course, and um, they're just gonna, they're going to break everything else. I think they're going to have to accept that uh, they'll never catch two percent inflation, and the new benchmark might be eight, or it might be ten, or it might be twenty. They're going to do a white paper about it and say that this is now the new number, and you know, all the PhDs there will justify it, and then everyone will shrug their shoulders, and life will go on at a different inflation rate. That's the only possible way that you can solve this, and you're going to you know, devalue the current debt stack with a lot of inflation. It's, it's all roads lead to inflation, unfortunately. That is quite a difference. Where at the beginning of this year, when we did our interview uh, uh, with Vinny. You and Vinny said that the Fed has to hike rates. They're ridiculously behind the curve. Would you, Porter, now say that the Fed is ahead of the curve? In other words, they're too tight? Um, no, I, I mean, that'd be a, a stupid statement. But, you know, I, I, I also said, you know, the Fed's never going to do QT. And, you know, while I'm not 100% correct, I'm pretty close because they're, they're not selling MBS, right? They, they, they yeah. were never, they were never going to sell MBS because it's extended... You know, the duration is probably extended, you know, five to 10 to 15 years on this stuff, not 15, but it, it, they've extended yeah. a lot. And I don't think they're going to sell treasuries. They're just letting, you know, the notes roll off, the short, shorter term uh, stuff roll off. And so, you know, the, no, the, 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 the Fed's never uh, stopped hiking rates when, when uh, the Fed funds rate is below inflation. So... They're in a tricky spot. I mean, they're an awful spot, actually, um, because you know they, they, you know, they've been so wrong for so long here, and they called the entire cycle uh, incorrectly, and now they're at risk of blowing up the world. So, I, you know, I wouldn't want to be Jay Powell right at this point. So, so uh, copy Porter says that the Fed is in an awful spot. If I recall, I think you on your blog, uh, Adventures in Capitalism, you put it uh, in a slightly different, more stronger way. Do you remember what you said? Well, I said the Fed is fucked. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's actually like a technical uh, term. Uh, you know, I, I'd even go further than, than Porter and, and say that, you know, not only are they not going to uh, catch inflation, but you know, if you think of it like a, a race, uh, inflation's already lapped them one. Yes. Like, if they're so far... You know, the inflation went and zipped past them a second time. And I don't think they can catch inflation now. I, to, for the life of me, I don't understand that, you know, there was a year-long period where my mom was calling me and complaining about the price of vegetables because she actually knows these things. And they were still doing, uh, what was it, $100 billion a, a month of QE? Like, th they could have pulled back long ago. Biden didn't need an extra round of a trillion of stimulus. Like, these guys could have all pulled back. And <laughs> instead, they just let it rip. And now they have no idea how to pull it back. I'll, and, I mean, I'll, they, they dug this mess. I'll throw in one more conspiracy that that um, I, like I said, keep saying these days, all my conspiracy theories keep coming true these days. But, um, you know, the, the, the real inflation was much, much hotter than the CPI, right? You, you had, you had uh, house price inflation of 20% per year and uh, rents basically did the same thing. And, and, you know, it was never caught in the CPI. And so, yes, you know, I would say real inflation is probably coming down a lot faster than than what the CPI is showing now. But it, they they lack them, right? They 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 they'll never catch up. And so, you know, it's permanent loss of purchasing power by the by uh, both American and and um, international consumers, right? Yeah. I would say one thing, though, is that in an inflationary environment, the consumers, they complain about the price of vegetables and everything, but a lot of them have gotten wage increases, especially on the lower end. 
And, you know, as a result, you know, those guys live in a nominal world, not a real world, and they haven't really felt the, the, the pinch yet. It's more the kind of the middle class, the upper class that is feeling more of that pinch because they haven't gotten, you know, the same wage increases. I mean, I, I, I eat a lot. I, I love food. I talk to the owners of these restaurants. And, you know, it used to be $10 an hour for, uh, you know, a dish guy. Now it's 25 or 30 if you could find a guy who wants to clean your dishes. And so, you know, at, at the lower end, there's just been massive uh, inflation on, on the wages side. So that guy who's cleaning dishes just tripled his, uh, you know, monthly cash flow, and his uh, basket of goods isn't up as fast. And so there has been a little torque there, and I think that's one of the reasons why the U.S. economy has stayed so strong. Uh, you know, people keep saying, how is the economy strong with uh, what's happening with rates, with what's happening with housing? And I think it's partly that. There's just a lot of cash going to people that really hadn't had any uh, income growth in 40 years. So, and that's part of what's making it so hard for the Fed to, you know, bring in inflation. The low end is much bigger than the high end. It's just the, the high end has more dollars, right? So you, you get the, what Jeff Curry talks about is the, the, you know, the low end in terms of number of consumers consuming barrels of oil or, or you know, gallons in the tank. That, that just, it's a, it, it keeps demand high for longer. Yes. Yeah. And that's something, another thing you guys have in common, which both of you have absolutely nailed the energy trade. Uh, Porter at your fund, Seawolf with Vinny, uh, invested in a lot of oil and gas and coal stocks. And I definitely want to hear about that. Uh, Copy, you've taken it to the next level uh, where you were very, very bullish on oil and that turned out right. And not only are you saying, oh, yeah, it was a great trade back in the day, you're exceptionally bullish right now. Uh, and I'd love for you to uh, tell us why. Sure. Well, um, let's just use some quick numbers. I mean, right now, supply and demand are roughly balanced, and I don't think anyone has any precise numbers on this, but it's give or take a couple hundred thousand a day, roughly balanced. We're uh, dumping about a million five from the SPR every day between us and all of our OECD allies. So that's a million five. China is down by two million. Uh, that, that's because Xi is going around playing whack-a-mole and closing cities of 20 and 30 million people just arbitrarily. Uh, you know, ch Chinese uh, you know, uh, aircraft travel and international travel, that, that's two million. Um, you, you've got uh, Russia, which will be down over a million uh, in the next year, probably more like two million. Uh, you know, all the U.S. Uh, Western firms left and they don't know how to pump the oil. It's very technical oil. It's all in the Arctic. They're going to have freezes. I mean, their system might freeze and they lose it all. Uh, so they're definitely not replacing what they're uh, drilling, and it's already in free fall. It's over 200000 a month right now. So add another million. So you're at 1.5 plus 2 plus 1. You're at uh, 4.5. Global demand grows one or two every single year because there's uh, 6 billion people that want the same standard of living that we all have. And most of those guys don't have refrigerators or microwaves or air conditioning. And a lot of them don't even have cars, or they might have like a dirt bike, and they're hoping to trade up to a Prius. And so that, that, those guys are in their S-curve, where when you hit about 3,500 of disposable income, your energy consumption expo explodes. And so that's another million or two. So you're somewhere in the 5.5 to 6.5. And then I don't want to be too alarmist. Maybe supply grows a million. You know, maybe they can unbottleneck the shale a little. Maybe some other stuff works out somewhere. You know, maybe Libya doesn't go offline like it seems to do every month. But let's, let's just call it 5 million for a big round number. That's the deficit. We've never had such a large deficit. 5% of uh, global uh, supply is, is missing. We've never had such a big deficit really in the history of energy going back a, a long, long period of time. And it's, it's an interesting science experiment of what's about to happen because it, it's all about to inflect. Uh, the SPR releases, you know, if something that's unsustainable you know, can't be sustained. Uh, they're going to end right after the election. I'm pretty sure that Xi is going to give up on these lockdowns as soon as he's made king for life. Uh, the, the Mexicans just hedged their annual uh, put. Uh, that, that, that's almost done now, but that put a lot of uh, you know, put pressure and uh, you know, option pressure on the, the price of energy. All these things are kind of dissipating. I think sometime in mid-November, early December, you're also going to see a lot of Europeans start burning uh, fuel oil as opposed to nat gas because it's too damn expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of these things are about to inflect sometime in the next 30 to 60 days, and oil's about to scream out of control. And uh, I'd love to be told why I'm wrong about that, but I, I don't see how you can draw down 5 million barrels of global inventory every day and not have a crisis at, at some point soon. I also think that we're, we're, we're in the peak oil, right? The, the, the peak oil production, if we're, not, uh, if we're not there, we're very close to it. Because look, look at that, you're not going to have another shale revolution come along, right? And 
in the U.S., there's there's three major sh uh, shale fields that are all in decline already. And you know, you look around the world, and and where's the incremental oil going to come from? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, and so I I, I don't know. And so I, I think we're we're sort of peak oil production, and uh, demand seemingly grows every year. Right now, you know, you th there is no investment. Right, we're doing all the wrong things. We're, we're not incentivizing uh, investment in oil and gas, right? We're not incentiv like we're doing windfall taxes in Europe for that. That doesn't help anything. And so, you know, you just don't have this, you know, you, you, we need energy supplies and we're doing wind and solar, but that, that's not doing anyone any good at this point. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the SPR, that's the, the U.S. has that and the U.S. is releasing uh, barrels of oil from that in order to, to tame the, the volatility of the, the oil market. And, you know, it, for, for time for the administration, the Biden administration, it was looking very bad in, let's say, late May, early June. But that SPR drawdown, uh, which is, you call that, a, you have a different name for it that I uh, would love for you to, to tell us about. Um, that, uh, you know, we, we were at about seven, 700 million barrels a day, and now we're at a little over 400 million barrels a day. So we're close to halfway of uh, being depleted. Um, you know, for, for the administration now, or maybe a month ago, it looked really good because the price of oil had gone from 120 bucks to, uh, you know, a little over 70 bucks. And as the, you know, White House press uh, secretary told us every single day, the price of gas has gone down for a hundred days in a row. Uh, so, but it sounds like copy, you're forecasting a much, much more grim future for, uh, the U S with regard to energy and, and the entire globe. Right. And, you know, what I was going to add to what Porter said, on one side, you, you have no supply. I mean, I, I've heard it called uh, fat shaming, which I, I think is pretty apt, you know, <laughs> like if you go fat shaming the energy companies, like they, they all go hide. Uh, excess profits, taxes, expropriation, you know, I mean, imagine being told you can't uh, export or you, you, there's a price cap, you know, like let's, let's be realistic. Uh, oil is at 90 right now. This isn't a high number historically in 2012 to 20. 14 until Thanksgiving of 2014, it was almost 100. And with all the inflation since then, you know, to say it's at 90 now, it's, it's not particularly expensive. I mean, it's like $4 a gallon. It doesn't cost very much, really. Let, let's be realistic. Um, and so if the administration's freaking out now, like, imagine how they're going to freak out later. But if you basically don't uh, let producers produce, and then at the same time, you go there and you give everyone a stimmy because uh, no one could do without, you know, it's socialism for everyone. You know, so like the UK, don't worry about your heating bill. We, we got it. Don't worry about it. You know, well, now no one has any incentive to turn down the thermostat a few degrees or close a light bulb when they're not in the room. Like, why would you bother? Like the, the UK has already, you know, stopped you out on any loss. So as countries go around doing that, and I'm sure we're all going to get steamy gas cards here in the States, you know, hey, Cuppy, here's 50 gallons. Go use it. You can't finish it all. I don't know. Give it to one of your friends. Let them use it. Like, what do you think is going to happen to demand? It's, it's going to stay high or maybe even go up. Um, and I, I just think you basically have taken the laws of economics, which have existed for thousands of years. And on the supply side, you've totally screwed it up. And on the demand side, you've given it like octane fuel and said, hey, consumers, go consume. And I think it's just going to go, go supernova. It's kind of like the laws of economics of, of, of the, you know, Europe... UK and Japan running their their central bank deficits for years like they thought they were better than everyone else they could they could secretly do this run deficits forever well the laws of economics are catching up to them and it's just, yeah, it's, just it's the same thing yeah yeah all these things i mean they were able to skate on by cuz people trusted them and believed them and you know it's one of these things where if nothing bad happens you just keep doing it and then eventually the bad thing happens. And you, you, I mean, the Japanese can't raise rates, even though their currency is in free fall and inflation is starting to pick up. Because if they raise rates, the treasury goes bankrupt. Like they, they have the same problem we have here in the U.S. If you if if, if Powell actually takes rates to 4.6, which is what he's targeting in theory, um, you know, you add about 800 billion dollars a year to uh, the, the interest expense, because despite having multiple treasury secretaries from both parties, they never termed the thing out. Most of it's in two years. And so if you add 800 billion, that's, that's our military. That's like adding an extra military. That, that ends up being almost 4.5% uh, of uh, US GDP. Like, at some point, uh, you just 
you know, squeeze the whole economy. You can't run an economy with like this lead weight around your weight, around your neck. It's just going to drown. And they, they, they can't raise rates. They're, they're stuck. They're just going to have to print it all and accept that inflation is going to be really, really high. And not to mention we've destroyed every pension fund in the United States at this point. Right, the losses of, the, of this cycle have already been greater than 2008 because of the, the bond market loss has been so massive. And, you know, they, they were all buying up these, you know, zero percent bonds forever. Would, well, well, good thing they all have their uh, VC investments and their private equity investments that are marked to model. Otherwise, they'd all get a margin call, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I promised Vinny I would tell the story when we were in, uh, in 2015 or something like that. Uh, our largest investor was a big Swedish uh, pension program, and we went to go see him. And I was a young, cocky kid, and I was, I was like, you know, th- th- this, uh, this European sovereign bubble is just nuts. I mean, who the heck's going to buy uh, negative yielding debt? And the entire room raised their hands, and I was like, oh, fuck. What I? <laughs> and sure enough, they, they, they redeemed from our fund about six months later. But those guys are all dead. Like, imagine buying a, 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 a zero coupon bond and uh, in 2000. Oh, they raised, their, they raised their hands to say, we're. Ra- I thought they raised their hands to tell you the answer, which was the ACB. No, no. But they, they, no, no. Yeah. They okay. were buying them all. Yeah. I, I said, I, I don't understand how you're going to make. Well, how do you understand to make money? You've got to find another idiot to buy the, 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 the bond at an even lower yield. That's the only way you're going to make money. And they said, well, that's what we do. Do you remember the great bubble in the Austrian 100s yeah. where those things just screamed out of control and everyone was day trading Austrian 100s? Like, have you looked at a chart of that lately? It's just like collapsed. It's down, it's down 60%, maybe more. Uh, British UK gilts, like the 30-year gilt, uh, it's down something like 40% in uh, pound terms and dollar terms. It's down 60%. And you saw the Bank of England uh, had to intervene. But So my question is, what's going to happen in between... The, the Fed pivot? Is it, is, does something have to happen first in another country? Because the Fed is, is sort of at the apex of the, the pyramid and uh, the, the, the U.S. will experience the consequences of easy money policy or rather tight money tight policy the last. So, you know, do you think that there's going to be blow ups and markets breaking like we saw in the U.K. elsewhere in the world before there's a Fed pivot? Uh, Porter, how about we start with you? I think there are. I think everyone's praying that this CPI number on, on Thursday is going to be light. I think that's the only possible way out for them, right? To, to say, oh, look, it's, it's lower CPI. Everyone brings down, dollar gets smashed, commodities rip, and, um, you know, party goes on for a little while. And, and, you know, people don't worry about it for at least for the next two weeks. If it's a much higher number, the, 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 the stock market's lock limit lower. So the, the current uh, terminal Fed funds rate is about, I think, 4.6% uh, in the spring of 2023, how far the market thinks the Fed can go, like the, the maximum rate. Do you think they get there? Do you think they go higher, they go lower? What's sort of the Porter Collins terminal rate for the Fed funds? And then what's the harris Kupperman terminal rate? They'll make another t- 25 bips and then they're done. That's my, that's my prediction. I think they just keep going for it. I think that they've decided that they're going to take Fed funds above uh, CPI and the two will cross somehow or, and, you know, blow up the rest of the world. Like, that's not our fault. I, I don't really know. I don't understand. If you, you'd asked me a couple months ago, I, I thought they were just teasing about this stuff and maybe they're actually serious. I, I don't really have a strong read on what the Fed's thinking and doing. I just know that if they stop right here and uh, CPI is eight and nine and they stop at three or three and a half, I think the 30 year just detonates. I mean, you can't go out there and say we're 600 bips behind uh, inflation. Take it for 30 years. Like, I think the entire bond market just detonates. And that's even a worse problem. That's basically what happened to the UK, where they detonated the bond market, which then blew up all the pension funds that, I mean, I always thought pension funds just bought like IBM and, you know, some like two year notes. I, I thought they all bought the bad stocks like that no one really wanted, you know, the problem is I, I didn't realize they were uh, speculating in the yield curve. The problem is if rates were zero, it was hard to, you know, get their, their, you know, their targeted return. So they just levered up at zero. I, you know, still didn't get your Yeah. Return. But I'm sure if they did that in the UK, everyone, the pension advisors in the UTA, UK told everyone all throughout Europe to do that. I'm sure, you know, CalPERS has the same trade on. Any way to lose money, CalPERS will find a way to, you know, get, you know, squeeze in on it. 
Um, no, I, I think if they uh, stop now, the, the, they lose the bond market forever. The funding cost for the U.S. explodes, and you know it's basically what the U.K. just saw. And they're going to blow up the entire pension system, which is going to force them to print a ton of money and bail it all out. I mean, it's very circular. Once you go above about 100% of uh, debt to GDP, every decision you make sucks. Mm -hmm. There's no good decisions. No. The only good decision is to grow your economy faster. And the guys running the country right now hate economic growth. So, you know, the, the only good solution is take GDP growth up to 10%. That's the only way we solve this thing. Otherwise, you're just on this hamster wheel, which is why, you know, countries like Argentina can never get their act in order. Because everything they do is, is screwed in some way. And, you know, the Argentines haven't made their lives any better, obviously, like Kirshner and, and their friends. But, you know, when, you have, when your debt to GDP is too high and your funding cost is too high, you just can't get yourself out of trouble. And that, that, that's the, the, the emerging markets trap, effectively. I mean, that's why Turkey can't fix its problem, you know. And that's and, our trap now. We're, we're, we're fucked. We're, we are, yeah, we're an emerging market, We're an emerging basically. market. We're an emerging market with nukes. Yeah. That's why I think that the dollar strength is, will eventually be proven wrong. Right. In the in the fact that, um, you know, I, I know it is the, 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 the reserve currency, but we're doing everything wrong to make the dollar strength. It's just, you know, we're just the, the, the tallest midget right now. But I, I think that eventually you will not see the same dollar strength. I just what do you mean by that, Porter, in terms of we're doing everything wrong? Well, just just the deficit gets larger every day. That's just by by definition. And, you know, we, we are eventually we're going to have to bring the, the balance, the, the budget deficit in balance because, you know, the, the that's just the, the simple laws of economics. And and I think that, uh, you know, our pension system, which is which was woefully underfunded. Now it's an absolute calamity. Uh, it just it's not going to be able to withstand all this stuff. And so. I think at, at the end of the day, the dollar will not be as strong as, as, as every algo which owns it right now thinks it is. I think a lot of that, though, is, is rate differentials, right? Like if, if Japanese 10 years at zero and the yep. U.S. 10 years at 3.9, your money's going to go to the dollar and the dollar's going to strong strengthen. Yeah, but, the, but, if you're, but if you're in a currency crisis like the, the U.K., Right. It doesn't matter how, you know, the, the, you know, yields go up because you're in a currency crisis, not because it's a rate differential. And so I, I think if you get to the point where, the, where people start worrying about the either not credit worthiness, but but um, uh, just the, the Federal Reserve printing and taking your purchasing power away, I, I think you're I think you're in trouble because eventually the Fed's going to have to print because there's no one. No one's going to step up and buy all these uh, all this paper. I, it just, it just, we have a, a glut, a glut of paper. That's what this is. Like they can do swap lines. They can do all this type of stuff. We're just, there's just too much paper, too much, too much debt. And that, that's the problem. And I, I just don't know how you get out of this, right? It's like quicksand. They, they can, I, I've, I said it 10 years ago, you, they'll never ever get out of QE. Once you get into it, it's like a hamster wheel. But right. they just gave a Nobel Prize for it. I, they did. Yeah, Porter, I want to ask you. So the uh, Nobel Prize in economics given to former Fed chair Ben Bernanke, which was it? Good decision or great decision? Porter, what do you think? I think Greenspan was the, 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 the original person who set the trap for all this stuff. Mm. Agreed. I agree with that completely. I mean, he should have let uh, LTCM blow up the galaxy. I mean, think LTCM was like... What was it like a two billion dollar loss amongst a bunch of different banks? Like, just think how small that is. Like, yeah. com compared to today's dollars of you know the magnitude of losses that happen. I mean, if if you don't get your SPAC off and get at least two billion last year, you, you kind of failed. You know, <laughs> like like if your dog walking app didn't do their C funding at a two billion uh, valuation, it, it meant you you failed at life. You You'd know? be too embarrassed like, to go to the party. It's like oh, it's only one point five billion. But, but like, think of the magnitude of what LTCM was yep. and the fact that it had to get bailed out because it was too big to fail. And now it's just like a rounding error. Um, no, no, Greenspan should have let a lot of these things fail. He should have, uh, whatever. Uh, I just think it's funny that they gave Bernanke uh, a Nobel right, at, right as the, the house of cards he really built up with QE is about to crumble. 
Um, it, it's, it's like at the precipice of the, the collapse, and they, they gave it to him. I would say on the dollar, too, I think what precipitates the, the fall. So right now we're in the everyone's scrambling for dollar liquidity, and everyone's you know needs dollars because so they're functionally short. You know, dollar milkshake. Yep. The, the, the next step is the central banks and the pension funds. They get their margin call. And then what have they been doing for the last 20 years? They've been buying treasuries and they've been buying FANG. And so what they're going to do, they're going to unwind treasuries and FANG because they're getting a margin call, but the margin call isn't in dollars. It's in British pounds or it's in uh, Swiss francs. I mean, do you see the SNB had a $100 billion loss? Like, think how big that is. Like, everyone's worried about Credit Suisse. I mean, the, the Swiss National Bank is, is, is the, you know, Death Star. They just don't have a mark-to-market function, so no one cares until someone actually needs their collateral back, and then the whole thing blows. Um, it, it, it's massive, these things. And I think that's what it takes the dollar down. Thanks. So it's, it sounds like both of you think that the moment right now in the SMAC environment has a lot of risks in it, where it's, you know, if you're running a fund, it's time to, like, degross, which means you have less money on the long side as well as on the short side. Uh, maybe have less on the, the long side. I don't, I don't know if, if, if you think this will be bad for stocks, but I want to explore uh, shorting stock. And I just want to say, you know, I don't think I can say the number, uh, but both of you have had phenomenal years, absolutely phenomenal years uh, managing money this year. And Porter, I know you've done it on the long and short side. And Cuppy, I know you've done it mostly uh, sort of not doing as much uh, short selling maybe as, as Porter is, is my perception. Uh, what is your outlook on sort of how bearish are you going forward, uh, Cuppy? And you know, is this is this a time to sort of back the truck up on the on the short side, or do you just think that the risk reward is is just too big in oil, so it's a waste of time to short stuff, Cuppy? And then and then you Porter. So I don't really short much, so I defer to Porter on on, on shorting. I, I do think that there's a uh, you know an, an abyss just beneath the market, and if they press it a little harder, all the margin calls start rippling through, and everyone liquidates stuff, and there's. You know, I, I think you could see a, a washout in tech and FANG and, you know, it's amazing to think that a lot of these SaaS stocks still trade at like 20 times revenues yeah. down from like 50 times. Like, I mean, at, at the bottom of the cycle, it'd be like one times. And a lot of them aren't profitable and they say, oh, it's because we're, we're investing in growth. But I, I'd have to think a lot of their customers probably go bankrupt. And, you know, a lot of that growth investment was, was wasteful, too. I think there's a lot of excess that still needs to be taken out. But what I, I, I just focus on... Uh, bull markets. And, you know, despite the fact that tech is, uh, you know, breaking, uh, I don't have any exposure there. I, I'm in the, 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 the bull markets. I mean, the bull markets right now are uranium and uh, energy. That's where I have the bulk of my exposure. I have some other, you know, idiosyncratic things in the book that I'm really bullish about. But um, look, if, if, if you think that uh, uranium is going to be the logical solution for green energy, it's the only solution. And you think that the price of oil is about to scream out of control, why would you focus on shorting a tech stock, especially because the day they turn the QE machine back on, these things are all going to explode out of control because every crisis needs more stimulus to fix the, the mess from the last crisis. And if, really, if J-Pow really takes rates up into the fours, they're going to need a whole lot of QE to fix it. And so I don't want to be on the other side of that. Uh, I, I want to be, you know, just letting it happen. I, I don't know. How do you feel, Porter? You know... I think it's. I think you have to learn throughout your career just of what you're good at, right? And 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 you you know you take lots of wins and lots of losses, and you, you hopefully you keep the you know what I kind of did right structurally and and what you did wrong, and you don't do that anymore, right? You know whether it's like you know investing in Africa. Okay, how about we don't do that anymore? You know, <laughs> you know the, the uh, you know so you know, what we found is that. Um, you know, we like shorting stocks, and so we always have some sort of some short short book on. And the short book's always a little bit different, right? You can take. I like shorting a lot of uh, everything I do is risk reward, right? It's not not quite the inverse of, of of being long, but you take Nvidia, which we were shorted at you know thirty five times sales, and or and you know the end of the crypto bubble and the you know slowdown in gaming. Or you know the the Kathy Wood Arc and all these unprofitable things, or it's Tesla, or it's Apple here at you know 27 times earnings, um, you know. So we're short a lot of this stuff. Car, you know, Carvana was a massive short for us at the at the top. You know, we're we're still there. I haven't covered a share, but it, you know it's naturally gotten a lot smaller. So I'm not I'm not pressing the stock here. Uh, you know, 
Coinbase, Beyond Meat, and I, I were short all of this stuff. Um, and so it's been it's been fun, uh, and it's also kept us in the energy trade, right? And our our you know there is a bull market, you know somewhere, and and our our exposure has been in energy, and you know. We've, we found it a bunch of different ways. One of the things we, we did is, is that, uh, the, one of the ways I met Cuppy is with, through Ketum, we, 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 we found a lot of stuff out of the, the uh, I think the original uh, one was, was both spinoffs and, and bankruptcies. We, the spinoff, our, I think our still single biggest winner is, was Dongela, which was a uh, spinoff of uh, Anglo-American. Yeah, unbelievable. We, we bought it at 180p, I think it was, and it's now, 2000 um, or, or something like that and we've and the dividends along the way and then I think that the you know every great investor you know a lot of the great investors were, were distressed debt buyers and you know if you think about the the coming emergence from bankruptcy it's the most elegant process in the world you've you've uh, you know you've you've taken away all the debt or most of the debt of these companies and and a lot of these you know all the bankruptcy, the only bankruptcies really were energy companies. And so, you know, we found Chesapeake in, in, in you know, in the, at the bottom. We found, uh, you know, California Resources, Valeris, you know, there's there a lot of these things which we, which were all in Cuppy's Monitor. And we, we, we were buying it every, almost every single bankruptcy we bought. And, um, you know, we, we, we held on to a lot of them because our, our basis is so low. Um, you know, and then I think the the best winner for us this year has been coal. And coal is basically we've deemed it the, the cheapest source of energy in the world, and the most hated. And so you can, if you're a contrarian investor, you love the most hated. And um, and in terms of demand, you know, I, I didn't really predict the the war, but the war happened. And then the the Nord Stream one and two, I didn't really predict that happening. But you know, these are all. It's all optionality, and in, and it goes back to what we said: is war is inflationary, right? You you blow up uh, Ukrainian power plants, and you blow up Nord Stream one and Nord Stream two, and you know you have problems. And so, I think that that coal, which still is valued at a basically one times cash flow uh, all around the world, or maybe a little bit higher, but I think these are 20, 30 year assets. And they're going to be around for a long time. Maybe the price is not as high, but in an energy crisis, you want more energy. And I think that uh, these coal stocks, you know, um, are, are going to be, you know, going to keep surprising everyone. They're just going to keep buying back the stock. You know, um, uh, Whitehaven in Australia has been a monster. I keep calling it White Horses, the tavern in New York City. But uh, Whitehaven's been a... Uh, been a monster for us and Dungala, Peabody, you know, I, I love all these stocks. And, um, you know, the oil and gas stocks, you know, I, I know Cuppy is in oil itself, but, you know, I own a lot of these upstream producers and they're just, they're cash flow machines at this point. And, you know, in my ideal environment, I would take a 70 to $90 oil price for five years because these things are going to cash flow like crazy, right? The, the, they're almost completely uh, debt-free, right? So they have, they're not beholden to the capital markets. You know, if you think about the inverse of, um, of uh, what's going on in tech, the cost of capital is going up for every single tech company, whereas the cost of capital for um, every single uh, energy company is going down. You know, BTU still has 10% yielding debt out there. It's going to zero. Right. And so BT used the coal company Peabody. Yeah. Yes. Which so, was during you know, the peak of uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, panic, uh, March and April was cents on the dollar. And now it's trading like twenty seven dollars. Yeah. So, you know, and so that, that's how we think about it. I, you know, I think these energy you know, companies, I was talking to this guy today, has this ESG orphans uh, ETF. Like it's yep. all it's all energy stocks and, and no people hate this stuff. There's been there's been outflows from energy and materials this year. And there's been, call it $30 billion of, of uh, inflows to the market to tech. People are going to the old playbook, which is the wrong way to do it, right? In, in 2008, there was $50 billion of outflow from the market. This year, we've had $50 billion of inflow. So people are still buying the dip. And, you know, that's one of the things that, that, that scares me. When do people actually wave the white flag and give up? 
right? Whereas they've already given up an energy. They're not, there's not much to sell anymore. So that's. Hmm. I'm amazed that private equity keeps selling their energy, but I guess they have a mandate from above, get out of the energy, improve the ESG score of the fund so we can do, you know, fund vehicle 19 or whatever. It's just amazing, like, if you think of why energy prices couldn't recover from 2014 to 19, it was private equity just drilling wells like madmen. The public companies kind of pulled back with the privates. And now the privates are finally cut off from capital too, which is why you just haven't seen the, the, the response really in the shale side. It, I don't know what's going to change it, but normally guys make a ton of money and other people get greedy and they follow. And here you have a bunch of guys making a ton of money in energy and no one cares. It, it's just amazing to see. So, so what uh, Porter mentioned earlier, just for the audience, is uh, KEDM is Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor, uh, which is a res your your research service uh, a Cuppy, and actually we you know it, it's a premium investment product uh, that we actually here at, at Forward Guidance have a, a deal for. So if folks can uh, stick around to the end; they can um, hear hear about the the deal. Um, I myself uh, am a user, and I've had the value of it. Uh, I'm, I'm a tracker of the SPACs, um, but but we'll save that for the end. Copy. I want to ask you. Uh, I'm, you I'm and a tracker of the very... SPAC unlocks. That's the you short the uh, unlocks. So that's... Yes, I'm yeah, short the unlocks. Those have been legendary. Yeah. So yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just give one. Uh, there's one I found in 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 Kedem, uh, S T R Y Starry, which. Uh, you know, as soon as they unlock, you short them at ten, and this thing went to three dollars literally within a few days, um, and it was fantastic. Uh, and I, I covered because I'm quote safe, but now the thing's at seventy cents, so it just just goes to show. Um, but but going back to much more important things, as, as we reach a close, uh, what are your concluding thoughts? And generally, I know you're focused on very idiosyncratic things, but you know, if you look at just generally risk assets, is this is this a time to like? put the pedal to the metal like it was in, you know, 2020, 2021, or is this a time to like raise cash? Um, again, not investment advice, but uh, what do you, what do you think, uh, Copy? Well, I can just only tell you what I'm doing and yeah. I put the pedal to metal in energy. Uh, as we discussed, there's a confluence of events that all happen in mid November into December that are wildly bullish where uh, basically a balanced market becomes a 5 uh, million deficit. I think energy is going to scream out of control and, you know, I'm just pressing there and same with uranium. I think, uh, you know, Greta Thunberg, uh, whoever uh, writes her speeches uh, must be prepping the Europeans for the return of nuclear because for 20 years they scared the Europeans shitless and a bunch of propaganda and they all shut down. I mean, they're still shutting down nuclear power plants into an energy crisis. I, I, I don't understand it. But the, the, the powers that be obviously got control of Greta and they're starting the, 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 the pivot in terms of, hey, nuclear is the only option we got, so let's go with it. And so they're, they're prepping the Europeans for this. I think you, uh, well, I, I think uh, we're gonna have a nuclear renaissance and I wanna be long a ton of uranium because there's already shortages of the stuff. And you, know, you can't uh, consume 30 or 40 million pounds a year more than you produce. At, at, at some point, uh, you know, there's a deficit and the price screams out of control. And you know, I love that trade too. I mean, that's where I'm pressing. The, the other stuff, I have no idea. I mean, mm -hmm. if you tell me, you know, what J. Powell's thinking, I can tell you what the what the trade is. But I don't know what the hell he's thinking right now. I love the trade too, and I, I, I'm just happy to just sit on it. I, I don't even I don't even look at it from a day to day basis. I mean, occasionally I'll pull it up, but you know, it, it's so far below production costs, and it's so clear to me that that's the only answer in town, and it's coming. And so I don't know if I don't know, and I don't actually care whether I get paid you know, this month, next month, or next year, I just know I'm going to make a lot of money. And when, when, when this thing explodes. And so, um, I, I'm with copy. I saw I'm, I'm playing it there, you know, in terms of the rest of the markets, you know, I, let's wait to see what the, the CPI brings. Uh, you know, I, again, I'm still short a lot of stocks. I'm long a lot of stocks. So, um, you know, I, I have, I had that trade on and listen, if, if the CPIs, a lot lower. I'll cover. I'll come back in a month and press the shit out of them all again. So I, I just don't think this cycle is over, right? The cycle doesn't end with no bankruptcies, right? The, we are so early in in the the grand scheme of of this cycle, right? We're just we're in the first inning of, of corporate profits, uh, you know, reduction, right? And uh, the cutting of estimates, all this type of stuff. It's all coming and. You know, the fact that, that, that the, 
you know, monetary policy act, acts with a lag. And you know, there will be no housing activity for two, three years, none. The buyers can't buy because price hasn't, hasn't fallen enough. And you know, there's, no, there's no inventory out there for people to buy. So they're, they're sitting there going, well, I'm waiting for the price to, to go down, but my wife says I need to buy a house now. And so price, prices aren't falling. And I, I just think that housing inventory, as well as auto inventory, everything, everything in America is bought on, on, um, on leverage, right? So there will be no activity going on. And so um, it'll be interesting how, how it shakes out here. So, so Porter, how rapidly do you think earnings and how drastically do you think earnings will, will fall? I mean, I think that look, look what happened to, to uh, NVIDIA where they, where, they, where they cut estimates three times in three weeks, right? You know, I thought we were in a chip shortage. A chip shortage is supposed to be good, like, you know, and, and it, it fell off the cliff that quickly. And so, you know, I think you'll see a lot of this stuff all over the place. And, you know, the the Apple shot across the bow. That wasn't the first shot across the bow, right? They're, they're gonna they're gonna hack numbers. And when when and when you know the the generals start hacking numbers, I, I think you better watch out because there's a lot of stuff that's already down seventy percent. But you know, Apple ain't down that much, and and every single American owns it. Every single person in the world they, owns it. I think people don't remember the lesson of 2000. Uh, you know, everyone says, oh, look, the SPACs are all down from $10 to 70 cents. Like, that's, that's contained. They forget that a lot of these companies, these venture capital things that never even got to SPAC, you know, uh, SoftBank was giving them money and they were buying a dollar of revenue and spending a dollar 20 on it and, you know, hoping to make it up in volume. And as long as you're showing massive revenue growth, you got more funding. Well, the funding's cut off. So what do you do if you're an unprofitable business that's never hit scale? Well, you start firing people. Uh, what do you do? You try to basically shrink your way into profitability, and where do you shrink? You know, Facebook or Meta, whatever they call themselves today. You stop buying keywords. You know, Google, you stop buying keywords. Like, everyone thinks that these big stocks, you know how many people keep telling me how cheap Google is based on cash flow, because, you know, it grows 20% every year, and, you know, it, it's safe, there's a lot of cash flow. I mean, they forgot what happened to Cisco Systems, where all of a sudden people stopped uh, buying equipment because all their customers went broke. I, I can see this happening, you know, cascading through the generals. I, everyone keeps thinking, like, the tech bubble is contained to San Francisco real estate or something. I, I think it, it is going to have much bigger uh, implications. And, Copy, earlier you said, oh, I think uh, tech has a washout. And the way you said it, like, I sort of heard it that, oh, that's just the tech sector. But, but as you say, and as you both know, you know, Apple is 7% of the S&P. Energy is what three or four percent of the S and P. It used to be one and a half percent of the S and P. So, if tech has a washout, the entire market has a washout. I'm not sure about that because I think at the end of this cycle, energy will be twenty-five to thirty percent of the S and P again, just like in 1980. And so, I think you're just going to see a massive rotation. And you know, early on, obviously, the rotation is going to have you know negative impact because energy is so small. But over time, I think the S&P will find a bottom just because energy will become a bigger piece of the S&P, and that's going higher. And so I, I just think you see a massive rotation. We, we saw the same thing in, you know, in 2000 where you know, tech was big, energy was small, and by 2008, it kind of had gone the other direction. I just think you see a massive rotation as opposed to just the bottom falling out. I, mean, I think you'll, at, the, at the bottom of the cycle, you'll, you'll see reasonable valuations throughout the market, right? There, there's... There's not a lot of reasonable valuations out there. I mean, there, there are a couple, but like, especially in tech, there's no reasonable valuations and numbers haven't been slashed yet. And I think you're going to be, you know, you're going to set up for the next big bull, bull market or, or ability to buy stocks in two or three years. I think it's going to be a great opportunity. But I think until then, you just got to be, you got to be patient. And I think it's going to be, I think you better hope for a crash because the slow painful water torture is going to be bad because people are going to buy the dip all the way along and get killed. Uh, I think the, the crash scenario is, is, is a better scenario for people because it'll, it'll swap the decks quicker. But the, the water torture is going to be, which I think it's going to be that way, is going to be tough. A crash also gives uh, Powell cover to pause. 
I mean, they like to say that they're not political, but they're very, very political. And, you know, when people are complaining about the price of broccoli, Powell gets to keep, uh, you know, pushing on the rates. When people start crying about their IRAs, like, they, they force Powell to do something about that. And so I think a, a big crash that makes it into the news that gets people like my mom to log into her, you know, retirement account and check what's going on. That's the sort of thing that I think uh, leads to the pivot. I want to change it to the, the Fed capitulation rather than pivot. I yeah, let's do, it, let's do it, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> full capitulation good, good. is better than pivot. You know, pivot's overused. Ah, okay, yeah. So a pivot is more like instead of going to four and a half, they're going to 3.75 and staying there. Capitulation is I was wrong. Everything. I suck. I'm terrible. You know, whatever. I'm giving back the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, ever, thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, we actually have a, a, a special deal up with your, your service, uh, Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor. Uh, people should follow you, Porter, uh, at Seawolf Cap, and follow you, Cuppy, uh, on Twitter, at H Cuppy. Uh, but yeah, let, let's uh, hear a little bit b before we get the deal. Let's hear a little bit about Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor. Um, Porter, can you speak to someone? You know, you're a hedge fund manager. You've you've been in this a long time. Um, you know, you rather work in a hedge fund that was featured in the in the Big Short. Um, how do you use uh, Cuppy's Event Driven Monitor, and and how have you found uh, it's benefited your investment process? Well, you know, we do a lot of screens on our own, and we have for a long time. In just terms of trying to screen out valuations. Um, you know, oversoldness, you know, overboughtness, uh, and, and do a, a lot of screens like that. Uh, obviously, a lot of valuation, um, individual sector screens. And then, you know, we, we came across Cuppy's Monitor, and, you know, it, it what I like, uh, or I do like, it has all these different sector, like, you know, investor day is coming up, right? I'm a big believer of I've, I've always said, if you, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say it so that there's no investor day. If you have an investor day, you actually have some BTU uh, for those uh, watching has an investor day coming up in, in November. Uh, you know, I haven't post bankruptcy. I don't think they've done one yet. So uh, that's one to watch. The BTU, the big news is, hey, they finally cleared that debt stack. It took them two years. Now it's about uh, shareholder returns. I think it's changing the whole narrative. Uh, let, let's face it, coal stocks are always going to trade at one time's earnings. I, I've accepted that. So it's, it's all about the capital returns basically is where your returns coming from. And I think that's why they're having an, an investor day is to tell the world, hey, look, we, we fixed the debt problem finally and look at all the cash we have and it's going back to you guys. And yeah, I think what you said on uh, investor days is, is one of my favorite screens. A uh, company that's been quiet for a long time, they suddenly, I mean, it's not just like you have to have something good to say to say it. it it's that... Um, it takes a lot of time to put together a 50-page deck and get all your you know, junior VPs to all give their five-minute pitch on whatever the hell they want to pitch on and you know, have your head of ESG come and talk about you know, all the smiling kids they got that are near mine sites. Like, this takes a lot of effort. They're not going to waste all this time and money unless uh, something good's about to happen. And it's just a great uh, scan. Yeah. yeah so so you know, there's, there's a lot of screens like that. There's the you know, insider. I'm a big fan of insider buys versus insider sells. Right? They look, look at uh, look at Elon. He sold stock at 400 bucks. He he knew exactly what was going on, right? Um, insider buys, insider sell. The, the the selling the selling teaches just as much as the buying as well. So um, activism. I, I always look at that. Uh, 13D monitor. Uh, Strategic alternatives. Uh, I don't give a shit about stock splits. Um, <laughs> and then the best short speed monitor, uh, SPAC uh, monitor, yeah. newsletter short monitor. So if a, a short seller who's an activist short seller comes out says this stock is a total fraud, you know that's important to know. Yeah. So I, there's a lot of the stuff that's, that's interesting that, that I don't have the, the brain with or the the bandwidth to to, to do. And it's it's simple. It's cheap and it's it's great and there's also the uh, cuppies community which uh, a lot of noise but a lot of good stuff too i i, I love it <laughs> thanks man i appreciate yeah. it yeah well I, I find is you know i have a podcast about macroeconomics and so obviously i put a large focus on that but i found that a lot of investment opportunities that i've sort of stumbled upon uh a lot through Cuppies event of modern uh are not macroeconomic it is 
oh, there's a lockup day and all of there's this stock that's insanely overvalued and all of the insiders want to sell the stock, but they can't until December 12th. So on December 13th, uh, you know, it's not a good time to own the stock. And that's important information to know. Um, yeah, Kapi, can you speak to why did you create uh, Ketum and and uh, wh how do you see, see the value um, you know, in, in your own work or for, for other investors? I mean, we created Ketum uh, at the time. I thought we were getting about 80% of this event-driven stuff, but we had no systematic way to do it. And I asked uh, one of my analysts, can you, you know, build a spreadsheet to track all this stuff? Uh, you know, I, I want to make sure we don't miss anything. And we really quickly realized we were getting about 10% of it. We were missing like 90. And uh, you know, I, I couldn't believe how much money I was leaving on the table because we looked at the spreadsheets like, yeah, I totally would have played that. Yeah, you know, I knew that was coming. That was last week. And, you know, and so we, we built it really internally for us. And then we uh, gave it to some friends of ours who were having data integrity issues. And we were saying, look, you know these companies too. Find the bugs so we can make the data better. And people started reaching out that I'd never met before. And they was like, Cuppy, I love this thing. Can you put me on you know, the, the, the list? It was just an Excel spreadsheet. And pretty soon we had 200 people on the weekly list. And I said, there's probably a business here, you know? Um, and, you know, if we get some revenue out of this, we could hire more analysts, make the data better. I mean, we have some great things we really want to do with data. It seems like uh, every couple of months we had a new screen. Uh, analyst day is something I'd wanted to do forever. We just couldn't figure out how to do the data. Um, and as time goes on, we find uh, other ways to clean up the data, make the data better. Um, you know, we, we have this four people working there now full time uh, producing this data. Like, you can't do this at, at home. It's impossible. Trust me, I tried. Um, but it's, it's really uh, data for hedge funds, you know, built by a hedge fund. And uh, we've added a macro section in the first couple pages. It's really free form, whatever I, I'm thinking that day, whatever's in the news. I, I, I try to make it uh, interesting and you know, different from what you could read just reading the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I think we flagged some great trends along the way, but, 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 but the core of it really is the event driven side. And, you know, we've really flagged some great things in event driven, uh, and it goes in cycles. You know, there's cycles like right now, you know, uh, macro is dominating everything, but in three months, uh, event driven will be back uh, dominating things. And, you know, if you're not getting the data now, you're, you're not going to know what happened three months ago that you want to leg into when uh, the macro quiets down a little. Um, but, you know, that's kind of why we, we do some of the macro side, too. But anyway, it, it's really a product just created by hedgies for hedgies. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that Porter likes it. it it's, it's great. You know, it's great to, you know, speak with someone that's getting value out of it. Copy Porter, great having you on. Copy, that was fun. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having us. It's been great. So you've heard how Cuppy, Porter, and I have benefited from Ketum. And as a forward guidance listener, you can too. And save $1,000 with an exclusive offer today. Using the link in the description, you can sign up for a four-week trial to Ketum's annual membership. With your trial, you'll get access to four new weekly issues as they come out and Ketum's entire back catalog of issues going back to 2020. This is very valuable. There's a lot of gems in there. In addition to this four-week trial, you can use code KEDEM1REF, that's K-E-D-M-1-R-E-F, to save $1,000 off your first year of an annual membership when you convert to a paying subscriber. Normally, Kedem is $4,000 a year, but with this code, you'll only pay $3,000. That's a 25% discount for Forward Guidance listeners. Remember, you'll have to use this special link and the discount code at checkout to get the offer. As well, if you have any questions, you can reach out to info at kedem.com or you can reach out to me at jack at blockworks.co. Thanks for watching. There is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the Blockworks daily newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the Blockworks daily newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.